Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 11 o'clock briefing today. Compost my body and memorialize my Facebook. Death in the 21st century. We have three speakers on our briefing today. They are Fahim Hussein, Clinical Assistant Professor of Future of Innovation at Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society. Malia Fullerton, Professor of Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Washington School of Medicine here in Seattle. And Lynn Carpenter Boggs, Professor of Soil Science and Sustainable Agriculture, Washington State University. So we'll hear brief remarks from each of our speakers and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So this is an exciting opportunity for all of us, I think, to talk about something that uh, we wish we could have talked more. So in the slide, um, right now, we have just a summary of some of the key points that uh, we will be, I will be talking about in the session. So first of all, um, definitely we'll be kind of try to summarize our um, perception, expectations about what is a digital afterlife. Uh, what do we mean by this? But more importantly, why it's so important, why it's so critical. That something uh, sometimes baffles us, and sometimes it ba baffles us because why on earth we are not talking about it. So um, I will primarily look into the design flaw um, with global implications when you talk about how we are dealing with this phenomena of digital afterlife. Um, then um, I'll go on talking about some of the sociocultural religious norms and conflicts and confusions uh, that come with mourning for the deceased. That's something uh, it's coming out and it's very confusing and sometimes very heart-wrenching. Uh, privacy for the deceased. This is something we did talk about a bit. We have some options for this, but still, this is something that hasn't been addressed properly. But more importantly, to talk about this emerging new world order where we are talking about geolocation-based governance, but at the same time, this emergence, rapid emergence of uh, these um, data czars, where, where we have these um, amazing, powerful companies coming up uh, with services for the people, but at the same time, they're having properties um, as our digital data, our private data, during our lifetime and after our lifetime. So how, how things are playing up when we are talking about this uh, different kind of citizenry, different kind of citizenship online, offline. That's something uh, I think we need to talk more. And then within this world order, it's also important to talk about where is my voice as an individual, as a citizen, um, as a citizen of the world, of a country, or a republic of X, and this X is a digital service. So how, how do we actually um, fathom these, how we, how we are dealing with this kind of identity or the identity crisis? And I see it as a researcher, um, as, an, uh, as a practitioner, uh, as a justice issue in terms of equity, in terms of um, um, looking into it from an access point of view, from an agency point of view, how much uh, empowerment, how, how, to what level of empowerment I have when I'm talking about my data during my lifetime and afterwards. How are we dealing with this? And then the new digital divide. This is something, if we go back to the first point, the design flaw. When we're talking about digital data, life after death, we're talking about data of uh, the deceased users, uh, the majority of the users, digital data users, will be, and still is, I think, and it's growing, uh, are the developing countries, the emerging economies. And we are talking about so many countries, so many societies, with so many different regulations, so many expectations and culture. Then how are we dealing with that? Or this kind of new phenomena is actually uh, making things difficult and widening the digital divide. Uh, so that's what uh, I'm going to talk about. Thank you.
Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it says Stephanie, but yes, I go by my middle name, Malia Fullerton. Um, and I, as part of this panel this afternoon, am going to be talking about um, sort of an analogous problem, which is not our digital afterlives, but our genetic afterlives. And um, some, we, when we think about our DNA, it's an intensely personal. Um, ever since the completion of the Human Genome Project, we think about our information as though it's sort of it's in some way an extension of ourselves. In fact, that's an overly deterministic way of thinking about it, but still our genetic information is very, very detailed, very personal, very unique to us. And DNA as a macromolecule is an astonishingly persistent. We can find it in fossils, and we are doing things in terms of our processes and our practices, in terms of direct-to-consumer genetic testing, in terms of our clinical genetic testing processes, in terms of research and asking people to participate altruistically in research, and also in forensic genetic testing, where we're increasingly inviting people to actively give up a bit of their genetic material to participate in these social practices. Um, and we very rarely I think hardly ever, in fact, I had not thought deeply about this problem before I was invited to speak as part of this panel. We very rarely think about where that DNA goes after those tests are done. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking about in my presentation is DNA is this amazing thing. It's very personal to us. We also share it with our biological family members. And we don't currently have a set of kind of a, a broader societal or even global consensus about what we should be doing with that information after we die and move on. And yet our genetic material is being maintained in collections of biospecimens, biobanks, biorepositories. Um, it's being held by for-profit companies in the context of direct-to-consumer genetic testing practices. Um, it's being, it's being um, uh, developed and contained in, uh, in hospital settings from the context of genetic testing and uh, medical practices. Um, and in some cases, um, what happens with that information after we die is very unclear. It's very legally, it's legally it's very unclear. Uh, in the context of healthcare, we have privacy protections, at least in the United States context, which protect the privacy of that information for a certain number of years. Um, but mostly we don't have legal or regulatory protections. Mostly our, our rights and interests go away after we're gone. Um, and yet, uh, there might be reasons why, in particular, our closest family members would like to have access to that information um, for, for medical reasons. Um, for other reasons, we might wish to have our information be known to our family. And so we need to begin to start thinking about these practices now, even if we don't think we have directly, actively consented to a genetic investigation. Um, and maybe most of us have not in this room, almost all of us will be invited to participate in these kinds of tests um, and exchanges of information at some point in our lives. And so we need to be thinking about this now, thinking about how we want uh, to dispose of this information, what, um, what practices and processes, how we want our preferences to be made clear and known, and who we would wish to get this information after we are gone. And, and that is what I am primarily going to be talking about in my presentation today. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lynn Carpenter Boggs. And uh, as was announced, I'm a professor of soil science and sustainable agriculture at Washington State University on the east side of this state uh, in, in Pullman, Washington. Sorry about that. Uh, and I am going to be talking about the environmental impacts of the current funerary options in the U.S. and some work that we've done at WSU on a new option called natural organic reduction. Um, currently in the U.S., there are two primary options for, uh, for uh, disposal or final resting of the human body, which are cremation and burial. Uh, so part of what I will talk about is uh, some other people's research about what those environmental impacts are um, and some new options for funerary care, including alkaline hydrolysis and green burial. 
Um, now, what we have been uh, working on is the, uh, the development of natural organic reduction, which is essentially the use of the composting process for funerary care. Um, this is a picture of finished compost, and uh, this is the team that has been working on this, um, standing outside of the, um, the vessel that we used for the research. And uh, in the vessel, you can actually see a picture of the, the starting materials um, without the, the human body. But we are using plant materials, fresh natural plant materials, in addition to the human body, and managing that through composting to produce um, high heat and rapid decomposition. Um, I came to this because I've done a lot of work in the past on composting, including livestock mortality composting. So I've been in, involved with that for over 20 years now, and it's actually a fairly common practice on livestock, uh, livestock farms, that composting is an accepted practice and actually in many areas a promoted practice by departments of agriculture and departments of health for the disposal of livestock mortality. Uh, this is a routine, um, you know, animals die, uh, everything dies at, at some point, so uh, deaths, some amount of deaths are routine. And then there are uh, large events. Um, for instance, about a year ago in Washington, we had a terrible blizzard and thousands of dairy cows died. What do you do? Uh, so composting is really being um, promoted as a way to deal with events like this. Uh, it's highly effective, uh, but it has taken some, some thought and some redesign to um, make this a process that, that could be um, allowable and acceptable for human use. So that's what I'll be talking about. Okay, great. Thank you all. We'll now take reporter questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring your mic uh, to you and kindly state your name and affiliation before you ask a question. First question is right here, second to last row. Hi, I'm Alan Boyle with GeekWire. I wanted to ask Fahim, what is the design flaw? Could you uh, tell us a little bit more about that? What? <clears throat> so first of all, you need to come to the session. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a, there are many design flaws, but first of all, imagine this. I'll, I'll just give you um, a, a normal example, like a simple one. Um, why do we use antivirus softwares? Because we know there's an issue with this. There are problems, malwares, and so many other things. So this awareness is there. We do talk about it. it no, it's normalized, right? Now, one thing, one of the very few things which is certain is we are going to die. Um, so then when we are designing things, we also need to better think about that. Uh, we have it to be in the back of our mind when we do this. So what I'm really disturbed about is when we are designing things and when we are storing things, even after our death, how those things are being dealt with, we don't talk about it. It's just not us versus them. It's not just the conversation is absent. And I think overarching, it's a huge uh, design flaw. And if we go deep, there are so many things. Uh, uh, but yeah, that's uh, overall the, my initial reaction. Question in the back. Hi, this is Christina with the German News Agency, GPA. So, what, Kayim, what would be, this is sort of a follow-up, what would be your advice to everyone, and I'm guessing everyone in this room, too, who has a Facebook account, a Twitter account, an Instagram account, I don't know how many else, you know, just things all over the internet with passwords and all that. And as you said, it's sure we're all going to die. So what would be sort of the will that I have to leave now for my kids or whoever to tell them how to deal with my Facebook account once I die? What would be your like uh, the detailed uh, advice for me. You said detailed advice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there, <laughs> it's an it's a money making opportunity. I'm not sure whether I should give you the. <laughs> so there are uh, there are several layers of things um, that add to this complexity. Um, first of all, we should talk about it. That's simple. 
we should talk about it. And whenever, imagine um, there's a new app. Imagine there's a new, uh, you know, uh, uh, social media, and we are all jumping into it. Um, and then, uh, first of all, I think we should ask, hey, what's their policy on this? Let's talk about this first. What's absent here is one of the design flaws is also that we, the citizens, the users, don't talk about it. We, we, we don't um, individually, collectively, we don't have to, we, we don't raise our voice, we don't raise this issue. That's something very, I think we should do this. Now, when it comes to the solutions, so there are different layers, right? So first of all, I think um, the existing solutions, if you search for it, um, um, you'll see these are just uh, password keepers, and that's pretty much it. Uh, most of the service providers, they're, they're, they're claiming that they're having solutions. That's what we are, we are looking into. But it has to go beyond that, right? Um, so first of all, I think there should be more open public conversations. Second, I think the public policymakers, um, they should be involved in these conversations. Um, and um, I think we are better off when we are in... Um, uh, the global north, or we are in the uh, uh, different uh, countries where at least we are talking about it right now. 46 states within USA have some sort of law. It was not there five, six, seven years ago. But the laws are definitely not uh, or, or, like f far from perfect. But at least we have some legal aspect to deal with. But we, we can improve on that, definitely. That's, uh, so that's legal option. Number two is service providers. Uh, it's, it's, it's more important for us to uh, not just not to talk, but when we are design, uh, designing things, we need to design responsibly. So responsible design is just not about open source or so many other things. This needs to be taken into care. And number three is uh, uh, about consent. So imagine if we are looking into um, um, leaving things for your, uh, for your ch children or something like that. So uh, I think... Uh, the conversation should go beyond that. And whenever we are using data, as we are looking things, I think it's, it's also very important. We were talking about it uh, offline, that we also need to ask our minors when we are using their data that uh, how to use this. And we should not ignore that. I definitely did not answer your question fully. We can more talk more about that later. Can I just jump in? Can I? Yeah. Um, so, Fahim, can you talk a little bit more? I, I agree with you that consent is incredibly important, and yet um, we just we all click those accept things all the time, right? I mean, I think consent doesn't work in the digital context right now. People are um, people have a right to ex to um, express their preferences, and yet they rarely choose to do so, right? Because they're so anxious to get to the activity, the app, the data. Consent does work, maybe not in the present terms and conditions format. Mm. And that's, again, um, I, I don't want to be this uh, guy named as the design flaw. But what, I'm, what I really want to say is terms and condition, the way we're doing things is not the right thing to do. Mm. If you, I had, um, I had the privilege as a professor to assign my students the things that in many cases I don't want to read but don't, don't quote it to my students. So, uh, so I had assignments in uh, different times where uh, my students read those terms and conditions. Uh, it's, some of them are like horror stories, like seriously. So I think we need to do things right on there. Mm -hmm. Then consent should work. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so we have a question here in the front row and then one near the back. Hi, Sarah Napton from The Telegraph in London. A um, question for Stephanie. Could you just spell out the, the specific dangers of keeping genetics after death? What might be the potential horror stories that might happen? Because, you know, are we being, could, is there a chance we could be exploited after death through that? Um, you know, I, <laughs> it's not clear what the horror stories are. And I, I sort of want to kind of push back on horror stories. Um, there are definitely ways in which our genetic information could continue to be used that we might feel uncomfortable with. So in a direct-to-consumer genetic testing context, for sure, our information could continue to be used um, in the context of the kind of relational exercises which are currently being done, like in 23andMe, finding relatives. And so what would that mean for 
a near or more distant relative to locate us via our participation in a direct-to-consumer genetic testing product long after we are gone, you know? Is that a horror? I mean, I think it's something to be concerned about and interested about, the fact that our genetic information can be basically commodified and continue to create and generate a commercial product long after we are gone, I think is something people should be cognizant about. Um, in the research context, it is possible that our genetic information could be used to ask and answer questions that we ourselves did not give permission for when we were alive and that we would be uncomfortable about. Um, that is already the case. It's already the ca that can still that can happen right now while we are alive, and many of our research processes are pushing us towards broader and broader forms of consent, so that we have less and less say in how our genetic information will be used. Um, but even even the little bit of say that we do have effectively goes away after we are gone. Um, will it harm us directly? No. Would it harm our close relatives? Probably not. Is it creating a form of dignitary harm um, where we would truly be objecting to the ways in which our data uh, and conclusions that are being drawn from our data? Absolutely. Um, so those, those are the kinds of um, concerns that, that we are aware of right now. These are the kind of, I, I won't call them mundane, I think they're incredibly important concerns. They're concerns that why individuals from some faith communities, and I, I want to put back on the table, this is an exercise uh, from the, the Science, Ethics, and Religion Division of the AAAS, there's some faith communities would have objections to, and why people of some uh, religious backgrounds might be less likely to want to participate in genetic testing or have their genetic material exist after their deaths. Um, th those are the kinds of things that concern me and concern other scholars in this space. Get a question in the back, and then we'll come up front. Here. Hi, um, Emily Davis with the NASW Travel Fellows. My question is for Lynn. Um, given where the process is at and the reactions you've had to it, how far away do you think natural organic reduction is from being an accessible, kind of normalized option in the U.S. alongside cremation and burial? Thank you for the question. Um, before I answer that, I want to acknowledge that we are utilizing lands that are traditionally uh, the home place of the Duwamish people that are now part of the Tulalip tribes. Um, we've had overall very positive response to um, developing this option. Um, I am continuing as a, a research advisor to a public benefit corporation called Recompose, which as far as I know is the, the only company that is uh, developing a... a um, facility to do this, and it's actually going to be in South Seattle. And uh, there is still um, a bit of research and development happening uh, to you know, convert this into a fully commercialized um, process, and the, uh, the timeline is for that facility to open in about one year from now. Okay, we had some questions in the front row, I believe. Oh, yeah, sorry, and you also asked kind of around the country. So there currently is legislation um, uh, moving in Colorado and California to also um, legalize natural organic reduction. Robin Williams, Australian Broadcasting Corporation. I was going to ask a similar sort of question because uh, I'd quite like to be composted. And uh, according to the maths, it will be sooner rather than later. And uh, in other parts of the world, perhaps, outside where you're working at the moment, um, where do I go, what's it cost, and what's left over? Mm -hmm. Bones, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not aware of anywhere else in the world that is actively working toward commercialization. We have had conversations with um, legislators in the Netherlands that are, that are quite interested, but uh, so far no legislation has, has um, been, been introduced there. Um, and actually, I had some contact from, from South Korea also, but I'm, I'm not up to date on, uh, you know, again, what, where they are in the legislative process. Cost is going to vary among facilities. Um, so there, uh, it likely is going to fall in somewhere in between the current costs of cremation, 
uh, which is in most places the low cost option of uh, one to two thousand dollars. Um, and burial, which itself has a high range in how much people spend. So the, the average in the U.S. is about 8000 So likely somewhere in, in between those. Um, what's left is, uh, is this, I don't know if can I can curl back, is, is this soil-like material, I don't know if, which direction I'm going. Any bones there? Um, so in our pilot study, there were bones left. Um, we uh, got to full skeleton, skeletonization and some, uh, some disappearance of bone. Um, the commercialized processes are likely going to use um, more thorough physical disruption than, than we used, which is also um, actually part of the cremation process that people are, most people are unaware of that actually the, the bones do get pulverized, and that's mostly what you receive back as the cremains. Um, and it's actually also part of the alkaline hydrolysis pro process that the, the bones are, are crushed afterward. So in this, there will be uh, some manner of further physical disruption, likely during the process, so that what comes back to the family uh, is uh, very, very acceptable and no... Uh, yeah, no, no visible signs of their, their loved one. Okay, another question in the front row here. The microphone is coming to you. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Vicky from the Daily Mail. I just wanted to ask about Facebook. Um, you talked about a design flaw. I'm wondering why it matters if somebody's Facebook page is still up after their death. What's the concern about that? I'm assuming it's me. Yes. <laughs> um, I intentionally don't want to talk about any specific uh, social media applications or providers because sometimes um, I think uh, uh, it's just focus on the, that service only. It's, it's, it's a problem beyond that. Um, but um, I will answer your question in, in a way that uh, any, any given um, um, live account after our physical death um, it can open up um, so many uh, interesting opportunities. Uh, in many ways, what we are seeing here is, uh, imagine you have an open account after your death and somebody else is using it, then um, she or he may use it for so many things uh, that may not uh, go with uh, your um, uh, values. So now, from the spiritual world or whatever world, you may be disturbed, that's something we don't know. But uh, your your keens, your, your friends and networks, that can be affected. Um, so that's a social part of it. But more so, imagine you, you're, you, you're, somebody is using your social media account to um, actively uh, like, um, you know, pretend that you are alive and then start pretending data, uh, like uh, accumulating data, start having, um, we, we also had a conversation about this, that uh, of my faked LinkedIn pro profile may have uh, job interviews, offers, and stuff like that. And many of the things imagine uh, I may do not require to uh, go physically, so online jobs and other things. So long story short, I can have a fake me uh, living happily ever after. Um, using uh, doing things that I absolutely have no idea. So then, uh, my my uh, say my my children, my my friends and families, they may have issues with that, and sometimes they may also question. And there is also a trauma issue with uh, that's related with this because I see uh, somebody else is uh, using my dead uh, say friend's account or dead uh, uh, brother's account, and I have, have no clue whatsoever how things are. And then there's a contest like we are saying he's dead and that he's saying no I'm, I'm pretty much alive so it, it, it's a very much confuse, uh, confusing and a messy stage how common is that? the question yeah. is how common how common is it uh, um, uh, my research tells me uh, uh, specifically I have uh, conducted focus group discussions and uh, um, uh, interviews in different parts of the world um, in South Asia Southeast Asia uh, it's um, unreported accounts are pretty common pretty common no um, there's a, I cannot comment on this right now uh, but uh, it's it's not very rare let's put it this way 
a question here, and then we'll <laughs> we'll move over here and in here. Thanks. I'm Eva Regard from a Swedish fun Science Foundation, and I have a question for Stephanie. And I read a book about the Gila line in the, the you, you're aware the cancer line. Yes. Where the relatives, when it became commercially business, the, the relatives uh, felt entitled to uh, or the right to have some stake at that. Mm -hmm. you, and uh, I mean, lots of DNR will make business. Have you looked into who's going to have the rights to the outcome of that? Um, yes. You're dead. Yeah. So thank you for that question. You're you're referring to the the very the uh, New York Times bestseller book by Rebecca Sklut on the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks, um, the the originator of the cells that became known as the HeLa cells. And yes, it is absolutely true that um, that immortal cell line became a workhorse engine of biomedical research around the world and uh, that the family received no uh, financial benefit as a consequence of that. And that was some of what was written about in that book. Um, and that was some of what was upsetting to her family. But what was, but as I, I talk, and I talked to students about that case and I talked to lots of people in the public, um, what was more upsetting for family members in that case was not that money was being made and that they were not getting a piece of it. What it was more about the fact that the researchers at Johns Hopkins University um, continued to interact with the family, continued to collect additional specimens and genetic information for many years without fully explaining how valuable their mother's data was. And so and so this gets to this issue that I talked about earlier of sort of these are these are non non-commercial, non-financial harms that many families feel about the ways in which their family members' materials could be misused, mistreated. Um, so it's not to diminish. The, the benefit sharing issue is an important issue in general in the United States. Um, you have no financial interest in your biological specimens once they are contributed to a research process. Um, it bas basically, they have left your body, you have no claim over them. This has been challenged multiple times and that, that continues to be the, the, the way we legally understand. But um, I have heard members of um, Henrietta Lacks's family talk about that material. They believe their mother's spirit is still in those cells. And so how we actually work with those cells and use that information as a research community, there are some profound implications that go beyond the commercial interests. A question here, and then we'll come over Thank here. you. Laura Sanders from Science News. I have a composting question. Um, how far along are these experiments? How many bodies have been composted? And then how does it compare with animal composting? So are there special considerations that a human body would have that animals wouldn't, so I'm thinking of pharmaceuticals or human diseases or implants. Um, what are those differences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the research uh, that was done at, at WSU Pullman, we used uh, six research subjects. And um, prior to that, um, Again, again, we've been working with um, livestock mortalities, uh, even on site at, at WSU for uh, for about 12 years, and uh, even within the vessel that we used for this research, we did preliminary testing with with livestock to uh, work on the process. You know, within within that um, infrastructure, and then since those six research subjects, there's been continued research using uh, livestock materials. Um, so uh, there haven't been, and, and we don't plan uh, to do more research with, with human subjects. Um, the considerations are um, both, uh, there are, uh, some of the considerations are social. So um, for instance, uh, when livestock composting is used on farm, uh, some of the materials that are commonly used would be uh, things like 
um, moldy hay or manures, which are clearly not materials that the vast majority of people would find acceptable. So we're, we're using different st starting materials around the body. Um, there, the diseases, um, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's a large body of research on composting livestock, so most of what we know about disease breakdown is, is through that work. Um, the vast majority of, of viruses and bacterial diseases are destroyed at, at, through composting procedures. Um, one thing that there's not sufficient breakdown of is prions. So, for instance, in livestock, composting is not allowed for uh, BSE, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, and so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be allowed for people um, who have who have have diagnosed um, Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. Um, there are yeah, implants are something that are pr pretty uncommon in livestock and and increasingly common in in people. Um, and I will say that different facilities will probably deal with those differently. Um, uh, so, uh, it's very common, for instance, for pacemakers to be removed um, prior to cremation and sometimes even prior to burial. There are so, some other materials that are, are commonly removed because they interfere with or are, are hazardous during the, the cremation process. So there will be some materials that, that may be removed prior. Um, and um, there will also just be a... Um, a, uh, uh, a essentially a, 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 a sorting process, again, which is used in cremation and, and other, uh, other processes. So before any material goes out to the family or would be land applied, there's a visual inspection and removal of those materials. So there is sort of actually a, a, a side uh, a side to the funeral industry that, that already works with recycling um, those kind of materials. A question here, and then we'll come to the front. Um, Adam Cohen with AAAS. Uh, kind of a follow-up question for you, Lynn. Um, with your six research subjects, how long did it take um, for the composting process to finish? Um, what, what quantity of, of final material did you have? And do you have any estimates as to the environmental impact as compared to uh, traditional burial, cremation, and even um, green burial? Uh, okay, I'm not sure I got all the the, the pieces of, of that. Um, so, um, yeah, actually, we might give, give that back to him for a second. Um, um, how long did it take? Yeah. Um, the quantity of, of final material yeah, and, and the, the environmental footprint. Okay, and, yeah. so, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the studies that we did were ranged from four weeks to seven weeks. Um, during that time, we were able to achieve complete skeletonization and some disappearance of bone, uh, which uh, uh, would, will not be the complete process that a commercial facility will, will need to go through. Um, essentially, it's, it's a matter of the amount of amount and type of physical disruption versus the amount of time. So whereas on a farm, uh, they're much less concerned with time, they often go six months or more and allow full decomposition of bone through that. Um, commercial f facilities, which will have higher infrastructure costs, will, will likely use some physical disruption to um, further break down the, the bones. Um, volume, uh, in our studies we were using between two and three um, cubic meters of, of plant material. Um, during the process, some of that um, uh, breaks down, so you're left with um, about one-half to two-thirds of the amount of material, so on the order of one-and-a-half to two uh, cubic yards is what, is what we were left with. So again, commercial facilities will be different. Um, the current idea is that families may want all of that material or just a small amount. Um, and in any case, there need to be local uh, conservation areas that are ready to accept the other material that doesn't go back to families. Um, environmental impacts. Um, there's been a preliminary life cycle assessment. Uh, because there's not a commercial 
commercial facility open yet, uh, that is all somewhat premature. So, in, you know, in order to see what the entire process is, it kind of needs to be fully in, in place. Um, so there will be some use of electricity uh, for the turning and aeration. Um, there, um, uh, yeah, there, there will be an infrastructure around it, so building uh, and heating, and uh, just for, for the room, for instance, for a funeral process. Um, there is also a net positive, though, in the development of that, that soil-like compost material, which has environmental net benefits. So it is a uh, multi-decadal carbon storage and improves soil health and plant, uh, plant growth. I see in the front row. Hi, um, just a, a, sorry, Tom Whipple of the Times. Um, just to follow up on the idea of other people using um, social media accounts, how would this, I, I could imagine sort of family members having access. Could you explain sort of the mechanisms by which this, in your research, this sort of happened and you found sort of a bit more detail about how people have taken control of, of people's accounts? In many ways, uh, it happens from the friends and the families. Um, and um, sometimes um, the concept of uh, keeping password to yourselves is not commonly practiced. Um, and in many parts of the world, um, these are f social media passwords are not the most uh, secret thing. It's the out there. So, and in many cases, um, in terms of the access issues, uh, you are using public uh, um, um, infrastructures or facilities to have access to the social media accounts or social platforms. So that way, it can also be distributed. One of the um, one of the common spots um, in South Asia uh, of um, breaching privacy uh, in digital data is uh, the mobile recharge shops, or where the mobile repair shops, where you are leaving your phone and to be trusted. And in many cases, what they do, sometimes they uh, implant uh, what we have seen, uh, some uh, spyware. And in many cases, they just uh, transfer all the data to other places. Um, so that, that happens all the time. So it happens in, in both ways. Um, uh, sometimes the friends and families use it, and sometimes uh, the other peoples who get access through these kind of uh, venues. Thank you. We have time for one more question in the back. <laughs> This is just a very brief follow-up, uh, again, for uh, Lynn. We're talking about the material that the family gets. How regulated is it for the families what to do with that material? Like, can they use it in their garden or put it on their, you know what I mean? Like, is, are there regulations on it? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Washington State is the first state to, uh, to legalize uh, the natural organic reduction process. Um, and the regulations are not yet finalized. So we're expecting those within the next couple of months. Um, and we expect that the regulations on the, the final disposition of those materials will be the same as for cremains, so that they could be applied on, on uh, privately owned property and certain publicly owned uh, properties. So we've now reached 11.46. I imagine there may be other questions for these speakers. So we've made room 208 across the hall available if you would like to go over there and continue discussions. But thank you to all of our speakers. This was a fascinating discussion. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.